How many of you have been here two hours ago for the first class? OK. Hands down. How many have not? <laughs> so much I have to start again. All right, I love this. Um, the, 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 top, the title on the slide is wrong. I, just, I didn't realize that I have to edit for a different topic. We're not here to talk about the business. This was before. We're going to talk about lighting. But I will show you some tricks, which I hate to use the word tricks. It's not a trick. It's science. Light is there. But I'm going to show you some techniques on how to implement it to get better photos and stand out. If you saw the class before, you know that you, you realize by now you want to stand out, right? You want to look better than others. You want to create better, unique things. That is why you, people are going to pay you more than the others. What I've learned is that most photographers are really awesome at using a relatively long lens, 105 or 7200, or those wide aperture lenses when there's all the light in the world and image stabilizers and just shoot with available light and call it amazing things and some of those things look amazing they look great but what happens when the lights are off what do you do then you just take put the camera down <laughs> what if your engagement shoot lasts past the sunset don't you want to continue shooting what if you shoot beautiful portraits all day you've been creating beautiful photos from a wedding getting ready and the little girls and the bridesmaids and the groomsmen and the father kissing the bride in the church and all this beautiful stuff and then you get into the venue and it's dark I'm not talking about a few up lights and LEDs I'm talking dark okay what happens then you put your on-camera flash and you start getting those deers at the headlights okay I'm going to teach you how to change that how to make your photos look better than anyone else Okay, this is what we're going to talk about today. I'm going to talk a little bit about physics, which, believe me, I miserably failed in school. But I've learned something recently, and I think that it's appropriate to talk about that before we actually talk about the light and the gear. Okay, I'm going to show you some, uh, some uh, uh, techniques on how to create artificial lighting, because really you want to shape the light, you want to create the light, bring it with you everywhere. You can't count on light to be there for you, okay? Um, I'm going to show you a little bit about the gear I use, just a little. I couldn't bring everything with me from DC to here, but I'll show you just a little bit. And uh, basically, we're going to start upgrading our images. That is the key, okay? Before you implement anything, this makes sense, right? I don't need to explain it. You can have a lot of Photoshop and a lot of techniques and presets and actions and plugins. But if you don't shoot it right, you're just creating yourself more work later. OK? Is that, everybody knows that? Pulse check. Anyone? Yeah. Good. It's important. No, no, no. Shoot it right. That's your goal. So anyway, this is not shooting right. We're going to talk about the venue lighting first, off camera for portraits later. This is not shooting right. I mean, do I need to explain? <laughs> it's yellow. And different white balance because my flash was set to daylight and the room is lit with tungsten and you're getting the mixed white balances, their skin is pale, the room is too yellow, can't see anyone here. Uh, we called it artistic at some point in our career. <laughs> uh, this is what I do now. This is the difference, okay? Look at this. Show me right now. Get on your phone if you can Google and find a wedding photo that you can pull off easily that you can see a rim light, hair light, on almost every guest in the room. Show me that. And if you really want to see the fine detail, look on those screens. You can see what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about just the bride on the left side of her head and on the back and on that weird guest that's standing behind her all of a sudden decided to stand. I'm talking about every guest in the room. How do we do that? Off camera lighting. Very simple, OK? How do we do all that with off camera lighting? In order to turn on the light, the flash that used to be on your camera, in order to turn it on, you need triggers. There's all kinds of triggers. There is the built-in infrared, which is the cheapest, but has its own limitations, line of sight, right? If the other flash doesn't see it, it doesn't work. So that doesn't really work when I shoot receptions. Okay? The next one, I used to use that 
Have you ever seen the photographer doing the Karate Kid? <laughs> I used to do that a lot. Realized that 7200 lens on a full body kind of hurts you after a while. And still has limited limitations of its own. So I moved on to my absolute favorite products. I need to update this photo. But my absolute favorite products is all the pocket wizards. This has a range of what, Matt, 1600? 800 feet. If your clients are six, six 800 feet away from you, just ignore them. <laughs> so you really don't have to use the maximum range. But that's the range on it, and it's consistent. I've never had a pocket wizard that doesn't trigger. I'm not trying to sell you pocket wizard. There's other Chinese and, and Japanese brands that are, you know, they'll work. But I like consistency. That's why. Venue lighting. This is what I do. This is my typical setup, and I don't have it here, but you can imagine what a light stand looks like, right? You all have light stands? I take a light stand, okay? And preferably 12 foot or more. Why do you want to use more than 12 foot? Say again? So that the light comes down instead of travel. If I'm lighting, if I'm the, so if this is our source of light right here, and I'm aiming it at this gentleman, he's going to cast a shadow on him. If the light comes from here, no shadow. The higher, the better, OK? With limitations. So that's one thing. Yeah. Anybody heard of Ingress Square Law? Yeah. Could you tell us what it means? Because <laughs> I, I don't. It's square root. So OK. Distance. What we're trying to say here is that you need to back your lights off. If you understand it, you'll know you need to take your lights a little back from the scene. Don't get too close. What does it mean in reality? If this is your light source, right there at the end of that triangle, and you have two people standing like you two are, OK? Everybody's following me? And I'm blasting them with light. They're both receiving the same amount of light. Agreed? Mm -hmm. Right? If one person moved away, doubled the distance, he only received a quarter. He only gets a quarter of the amount of light. Am I right? Two square. Yes. Double two square. Four. Okay, fine. <laughs> <laughs> and if he moved further back, then what happens? Four times. Exactly. What does that tell you? Lose power as it goes away. Exactly. That's why when you guys do a group shot, if you ever have to do a group shot of like four rows of people, mm -hmm. and you stand there and you're blasting them, so the first one is overexposed, the middle one looks semi okay, the third one is the semi okay minus, and the last one, the last line is kind of dark, right? Here is what you do. This is what you. What's what? This is what I just described. This is your first and second and third line of people. If you moved your light back, not like me breaking things, what is the physical, t explain to me the physical effect. Well, if you move your light back. Now the whole group looks like it's a smaller group. Exactly. The relative distance is smaller. You guys understand it? Because if you don't, I'm with you. <laughs> And to get even better, see how they're light evenly? It's because your light moved further away, but relatively now they're a lot closer to each other and they're not doubled the distance from the light as before. So that, that if you take that theory in effect, it simply means pull your light back. But you know those gels that come with the flash, the orange, the green? There's a purpose, there's a reason to have those. And I'm going to show you what it is and why you need them. Color temperature. The sun is roughly 5,000 5, to 6,000 Kelvin. That's the color temperature of the sun. And it changes depending on the time of the day and the weather. Your flash is set to 5,500 Kelvin. Uh, if I walk into a room and I see uh, uh, fluorescence, I'm just, I know I'm screwed, so I don't even mess with that. But tungsten is what most venues and ballrooms are lit with the last one, and it's very easy to adjust 
and to gel your, your, your light sources to match it. Now why do you want to match your light sources? You guys ever shoot in a room when your camera is set to a different white balance by mistake yeah. and you see the, all of a sudden the daylight looks blue? Yeah. That's exactly why you need to gel. If you're going to take this, this is equivalent to daylight and I shoot it right in here. Is the sun in the room? It's not. If I use it to light you and the ambient lighting, which is a different color temperature, lighting the room, what do you get there? Color. Mixed white balance, two different color temperatures. Now either I go and gel every light bulb in the room to match daylight, or what's easy? Gel the one light that is lighting her to the, to the room. And if the room is gelled with uh, tungsten, if the room, I'm sorry, is lit with tungsten, then I will use an orange, a CTO gel. And if the room has fluorescence, I would use green. Remember I told you fluorescence has a very ra wide range? It's hard to tell. With fluorescence, I try. Uh, to be honest, I've never got into a res uh, ballroom that was all fluorescence. It's usually board meetings and things like that. So there's all kinds of intensities of gels. That's how I like to see it. That's how I like to try it. I like to start with half CTO, see how far I need. If you blast more power through the gel, the gel actually has less effect. You know that? If you take a gel, and I don't have here an example, but if you take one of those gels and you put it through a flashlight that is dimmable, picture that for a second, and you dim the light down, you'll see the color of the gel, right? If you start turning the power on, it's so bright, you stop seeing the color, right? You stop seeing the color of the gel. So it all depends on the amount of power you're going to use for these. But I like to start as low power as possible, that's my rule, and half CTO that matches the color temperature that those lights in the room are producing. Okay? This is an example. 40, 50 uh, foot ceilings, ballroom in, in uh, Pennsylvania. I don't have it to show you a light stand here, but you know what a light stand looks like. These are the flashes that I use. Quantum, Q flashes. Have you seen those before? They're about 10 times more powerful than a speed light, and they're powered by a battery. Not 10 times more expensive, but with the battery, it's about two, three times more expensive. That's what I do. And instead of mounting this on the monopod that you see here, this was made for a portrait to go outside to be portable. I have four of those setups. Similar, without the speed ring, this is for the soft box. Four of those setups on a light stand aimed 45 degrees or, or 40 degrees to the center of the dance floor from around the room. And I start with sending them to very low power, 30 seconds. That's all. And they're facing down. And I have four of those in the room, as you can see, and two on the other side of the dance floor. And they're all aiming down. And they're turned on and the pocket wizard, which is the radio receiver, turned on, I gel them. That's what it looks on the inside. Here's a gel. Okay? This is a CTO, half CTO. This is the average, most, what you need from most places. I've never had to change it. Um, you put it in. And now, the lighting in the room matches the ambient lighting. Because every light bulb in the room is tungsten. And my flash, which normally as is shoots daylight color temperature, right now shoots, sorry, shoots tungsten. Um. <laughs> Some of them ask, well, when you do all that? Well, I'll tell you when I do all that. I set all this up during the cocktail hour. That's when I do it, very simple. I have a whole hour, that's why they call it a cocktail hour, and I go and I set it up, because I tell the couples, look, if you really want photos of your best friend starving, stuffing their self with shrimp, fine, we'll be there. But we really want to go set up and get ready for you opening the door. So we do it, and if I have to be somewhere else, or if we're split in traffic, my assistant's associates, they're familiar with my gear. They know how to open the suitcase and set up the room in six minutes. 
turn these on, plug them, lift them up, connect them, trigger them, everything, including doing tests for me. I walk in, they're just handing me a pocket wizard. Okay? So when we do all that before, which is when you want to do it, you can actually take beautiful room shots. I mean, don't you dream about not taking a tripod to a wedding? Remember those room shots that you used to do with a 20 second exposure on a, light, on a, on a tripod with a remote? And then the waiter walks by, and you're saying, the exposure is so long, he's going to look like a ghost. Don't you want to shoot at 80th of a second and capture every possible color correctly and get sparkle from all the silverware and the glasses at the table? That's what I want. I'm guessing that's what you want. Every detail shot I do in the room is already lit by the same setup that I use for the reception itself. Here's another example of where you can use it. And you can't really tell because basically white walls. But this is a class in my studio that Nick Arojo, have you heard of them? Mm -hmm. him? He came to my studio to do a class for all the hairstylists in DC. So I basically clamped a lot of lights on light stands. And I used the same system with smaller power speed lights in my studio. So you can see how the guests are well lit all the way in the back. Very, very simple. You can do it anywhere. I could do it in this room if I wanted. Um, outdoor portraiture. <coughs> That's how we do it. Very simple. See you later. No, I'm kidding. Um, outdoor portraiture, what does it mean to me? It means that when I go outside, I used to be able to tell my, I used to tell my engagement uh, session couples, we're going to shoot from 4 o'clock roughly until sunset or an hour before. This was my mantra. I used to say that. Why? Because when the sun is, sun is setting, you can't shoot. You can't get creative with on-camera light. I mean, you can, but who wants to? You're afraid of the light. I was afraid of the light. Then I started learning a lot more about light, how creative you can be with it, how sometimes you can overpower the sun with light, with the right power. OK? So uh, we did this one in Central Park just, just a few months ago. By, we already shot their wedding since. But the same setup that you see in the picture is what I have here to show you. And that's the reason I brought it as is. And it's, unless I really feel like I have to get too creative, I'm going to stick to one light. Just one, OK? Um, monopod, but if you have to and you don't have an assistant like this, get a light stand. You could. It'll just take a few extra moments, but you'll set the light to be exactly where the person is holding it. Um, I love using soft boxes versus umbrellas. And another thing I love to do is I like to put grids on my soft boxes. I'm in love with grids. That's my favorite light shaping tool. Uh, I get a lot more uh, focused lighting, a lot more accurate, and a little more uh, contrast and edgy. Um, and again, I use pocket wizards to trigger it. Here's an example, off-camera lighting. Now try to shoot this without off-camera lighting. Can you give me two scenarios? Three scenarios. That was number three. What's the other two? You expose for the bridge. You get nice silhouette. And you tell the couple, look how creative you guys look with a silhouette. Don't you love silhouettes? <laughs> <laughs> look at each other so I can get the heart shape under your chins. OK. Shoot for the couple. And you have to burn in the bridge. Exactly. No bridge. Blown out. Right? That's the two scenarios. Or. You tell them to pretend their monuments for about five minutes when you can bracket and shoot multiple exposures and go home and work for 16 hours and HDR it, and you'll still get weird looking photos, <laughs> right? It's going to look weird. Well, I mean, I'm sure it could look amazing, but I am not a Photoshop artist. I'm a photographer. I don't want to be on Photoshop. I didn't use Photoshop for these photos. There's no Photoshop. This is straight out of the camera. Give or take a texture I added. That's it. So what, how did I light it? I simply had a person grab this. And let me show you what the setup looks like, actually. I will need an assistant. Not everybody at once, please. <laughs> Too late. Uh, I'll just want you to hold it. I'm sorry? That's what she said. Um, this is a uh, 30 by 30. 
I think it's the largest that they make. Again, I am not, it's not a Napoleon complex. I just like to have more than enough. And that's what it looks like. Okay, that's the back. That's the front. The grid is not on it yet. And the beauty about those things is that they fold really fast. In and out, whoa, Nelly. In and out. And when I move from one location to another during engagement shoot, I simply pop it back into the trunk. Oh, I forgot something. This is only used for reception lighting. Yeah, you know what? Watch out. There you go, you're good? All right. This is how it looks when I use this. This is the speed ring and a special adapter in 45 degrees. If you don't use a, uh, a Q flash, you have a little cold chute to mount a speed light here. But this is a 45 degree adapter that's designed for this. $80 no less. And you simply put, huh? Who? Don't worry, we'll do it again. No, I want to see the, the light without the thingy on it. There you go. Thank you. You're welcome. Would you hold this for me really steady? It pops in. Well, actually, you know what? To be honest, here I got it. You can sit down. Okay. To be honest, the easiest way to do it is like this. I was trying to be uh, to show it to you, but it's just not easy. And boom. No clips, no clamps. Boom, it's there. <laughs> uh, there you go. Okay, very simple. My assistants hate doing this. I don't care. Why do they hate doing it? Because it's heavy. It's annoying. It's not light. Sorry. So the way I lit this one is I had the soft box simply 45 degrees from the left. Very simple. I set the exposure for the bridge. That's how you set your exposure. Set for the ambience and for the background. And then use your flash and aperture to get them. This is where we lost the soft box. It was the last portrait before the reception started. Uh, we got on the dock, it was kind of windy, and boom, right after this shot, popped off. Fell into the swamp. See you later, $300. <laughs> but you know what? I don't care, we got the shot. New York City, same idea. Here we tried to create a different effect. We actually tried to slower the shutter speed to get some of that blurry motion. And I'm a big fan of shooter in, in one shot. Yeah, I could bracket, I could create a shot and then, uh, what do you call it, composite and all that. But I wanted to get in one shot, so I had to make them just kind of stand still, stay freeze. Shot it probably, I think, at like fifth of a second or something like that. And boom, got it. Capital. Another shot. That's one of those photos that the couple saw you doing it with another one. They come back and we do the same. Yes, we can. <laughs> Why not? So we get the same thing. This, this was not lit perfectly, I can tell you that. Too many shadows. But there, there was extenuating circumstances in the shot where she passed out right after this. And we couldn't get it better than that. Um, we shot it with a big light source uh, right here on the left, which wasn't power, powered high enough, I can tell you. We had a rim light on him, a flash that was simply held like this from here. That's it. Two lights. What speed? Obviously you get oh, I don't remember, but I'm guessing maybe 20 or 30th of a second. At pretty high ISO, maybe ISO 2000. I mean, it's, it's midnight, pitch black. All right, we're done, right? All right, thank you guys. For more information, please visit us online, give us a call, or stop by our New York City Superstore. You can also connect with us on the web.